In the last video, I showed you how to install our SR860 Python driver to communicate with an SR860 from a PC running Python. Make sure to watch that first video to get your Python environment ready and establish a remote connection with your instrument. In this video, we will use the Python driver to interact with the instrument from the command line by following the getting started guide of the lock-ins operation manual. If you want to jump ahead to writing Python scripts in a development environment instead of the command line, check out the next video. In the Python prompt, we have already imported the SR860 driver and established a connection via your preferred interface. The guide instructs us to turn on the instrument with the local key. This simply restores the lock-in's default settings and is equivalent to sending the reset command. If you recall from last time, we learned about the DIR helper and one of the methods available at the top level is reset. So I can simply call lock-in reset. Next, we connect the sign out to the A input so that we actually have a signal to look at. Following a reset, the output amplitude of the sign out is set to zero. We can see on the front panel that X, Y, and R read zero while theta is bouncing around due to the small amount of inevitable noise on X and Y. Before we charge forward, let's see how we can query the measurement results remotely. There are a couple of ways to do this. Recall that the lock-in is organized into components. One of these components is data. Let's look at the available commands within that. You can simply use the DIR helper again on the subcomponent itself. For example, data.dir returns the full dictionary of commands and methods in the data component. Here we see the value command listed as an available command, and it uses the out p command mnemonic. If you happen to be familiar with remote operation of the lock-in, you may know that this returns a single measurement value. But what is the Python syntax for using the value command? Another useful helper function is the git command info method. Here we call git command info and pass the name of the command we are interested in as a string. We see that this is a so-called float index git command, meaning that it returns a float, requires an index parameter, and is a git command, or query only. I can see in the index dict that the x value corresponds to index 0, y corresponds to 1, and so on. You can find the same information in the operation manual if you search for the out p query. 0 is x, 1 is y, 2 is r, and so on. So, to get the x and y values, we simply ask for value 0 or value 1. There's the x value, and there's the current y value. Through the magic of Python dictionaries, we can also use the key associated with each index value. Perhaps the key is easier to remember than the index. Of course, these values represent the measurement result at a single snapshot in time, so if we query x, then query y, as we just did, those measurements are separated in time. It's possible that our input signal has changed appreciably during that interval. There are two methods we can use to capture multiple values simultaneously. Let's look at the data methods. Oops. Let's try that again. I hit enter too soon, but was just able to finish the command there. For clarity, I will rewrite it. We see get values and get channel values. You can use get values to query two or three parameters from a single instant in time. Or you can use the get channel values with no parameters needed to query the four data channels currently displayed on the front panel, green, blue, yellow, and orange. We can use the channel config command to query or set the parameters that are mapped to those four channels. So if I want to know what's on channel zero, I can ask this. We see that X is mapped to channel zero, just like we see on the front panel. 
y is on channel one, r is on channel two, and theta is on channel three. These can be configured using the same strings or indices used with the data value command above. For most of this tutorial, I'll use the get values xy command to capture x and y simultaneously. Returning to the getting started guide, we are supposed to adjust the sign out amplitude next. I happen to know that the sign out commands are organized into the ref component of the lock-in. Again, we can use the dir helper method to ask for the commands, and this time I'll just ask for the keys in that dictionary. Here we see sign out amplitude, so let's use that. This is a so-called command, which we can treat as a variable. That is, a query involves just asking by the variable by name, and intuitively, a set operation simply requires the variable name, an equal sign, and the set value, 500 millivolts. And then we can query again to confirm the change. Next, we are supposed to press the autophase key, but first let's query X and Y now that we have a signal present. I can use the up arrow key to fetch recently sent commands in the terminal and get values x, y. We can see that the 500 millivolt signal is present largely on the x channel, but there is non-zero y as well. Of course, by default, the lock-in phase is set to zero. Now we can go ahead and execute the auto phase as instructed in the getting started guide. This is a method in the reference component. So I execute it simply with a set of empty parentheses. If we fetch x and y values again, we can see that the y component has reduced a bit. Next, we are supposed to press the 90 degree key. This isn't available directly as a remote command, but we can simply use the increment operator with the phase command. We can see that the phase has indeed incremented by 90 degrees, and the signal is now projected into the negative y direction with minus 500 millivolts on the y channel. We'll go ahead and reset the phase to zero. Next, we adjust the frequency, which is also grouped into the ref component. By default, it's set to 100 kilohertz. The getting started guide discusses adjusting the frequency on the front panel using the knob versus the numeric keypad. I'll skip ahead and simply set the frequency to one kilohertz. Next, to understand the input range and signal overload behavior, we can make some adjustments to the signal amplitude. First, we set it to five millivolts. By default, the lock-in is configured to accept inputs as large as one volt. That setting lives in the signal component and is called voltage input range. Our five millivolt signal is a small fraction of this one volt range, so it makes sense to adjust the input range. We can automatically choose the best range for the present input amplitude using auto set range and then we can ask the lock-in what the new input range is. The range has been reduced to 10 millivolts, the smallest range that accepts our five millivolt input without an overload. Actually, this is the smallest range available on the instrument corresponding to the largest front end gain. Now we are supposed to adjust the output amplitude to 50 millivolts, which is larger than the new input range, of course, so that we intentionally cause an input overload. We can see clearly from the front panel that there is an input range overload. How do we get this information remotely? There are a couple of ways. First, to read out the front panel's signal strength indicator, which displays the fraction of the input range your signal is using, we can use lock-in signal strength indicator. This query returns a value from zero to four, where zero indicates that only a small fraction of the input range is being used, and four indicates an overload. Alternatively, we can ask the status what overloads are present right now.
The overload status returns a decimal number representing the binary weighted sum of all present overloads. Here we see that an overload status of 16 corresponds to an input range overload. We are instructed to execute an auto range again to pull the instrument out of overload. If executed during an overload, the auto range simply selects the maximum one volt input range. We can check the overload status again, and you can see that the auto range did indeed resolve the overload, but using strength indicator again, we can see that the signal is now not using much of the available range. So we are told to execute auto range again. This reduces the input range to 100 millivolts, which makes sense given our 50 millivolt excitation. And finally, if I can find signal strength, that is three, meaning we are making maximum use of the input range without overloading. Next, the getting started guide walks us through changes to the sensitivity and time constant. By default, the sensitivity is set to one volt. That setting also lives in the signal component and is simply called voltage sensitivity. This means that a one volt signal at the input would yield a full scale 10 volt signal at the output. It also means that the front panel displays are scaled such that they could display a measurement result of at least one volt. Since our excitation is only 50 millivolts, we see that the display precision is limited by the sensitivity setting since it needs to accommodate a possible one volt measurement. However, this is not true for a remote query of the X and Y values. This query yields the full measurement resolution. You can see 50 millivolts present on the X channel. Let's see what happens when we adjust the sensitivity. The guide instructs to use 50 millivolts. Note that on the front panel, the bar graphs and numeric readings display more resolution now. The resolution of the remote queries, however, is unaffected. Next, we are supposed to adjust the time constant. The default time constant is 100 milliseconds. This also lives in the signal component. We want to see how the choice of time constant affects the measurement noise, which is easily visible on the front panel numeric displays and trend graphs just by watching how much the values bounce around. But can we obtain that information remotely? Of course. Remember the data.value command? We can ask about the X or Y noise. The lock-in continuously calculates X noise and Y noise as the RMS deviation of X and Y about their mean values averaged over about 200 time constants. This is 20 seconds for a time constant of 100 milliseconds. Since we've been sitting in this configuration for much longer than that, I trust the value here. I can also see the values on the front panel bouncing around with few microvolt noise. If we reduce the time constant to 300 microseconds, we can clearly see an increase in the variation of the measured values on the front panel. This is because the 2F component that is produced by the multiplication of the signal times reference at the lock-ins mixer is no longer completely filtered out. We can see its effects in the X noise measurements, of course. The shorter time constant results in nearly three orders of magnitude more noise. And since our sensitivity is set to 50 millivolts, which also happens to be our signal amplitude, that extra noise is enough to cause an output overload. Recall that we can see the overload status using status.overload, and now we get a value of one, which does correspond to a channel one output scale overload. Even in an output overload condition, the queried values for X and Y remain accurate, though the measurements are now a bit noisier due to the shorter time constant. So a snapshot may show more deviation from the expected 50 millivolts on the X channel. If you're wondering why the queried values are not overloaded, it's because in a DSP lock-in, once the input signal is digitized by the ADC, the phase sensitive detection and subsequent low pass filtering are all digital operations in the digital signal processor, just operating on a stream of numbers. A query of X, Y, R, and theta 
simply return those numbers with their full floating point precision. Meanwhile, the output overload is occurring because the lock-in is trying to gain up those measured numbers by the sensitivity factor. This would result in an output voltage larger than what the analog circuitry can provide. Anyway, is there a way to reduce the measurement noise other than by use of long time constants? Currently, the filter slope is set to 6 dB per octave. This is a relatively slow roll-off, meaning that the higher frequencies, like the 2F component, are not strongly attenuated by the low-pass filter. We can increase the slope to 12 or 24 dB per octave. And then see if the output is less noisy. Let's look for X noise. That indeed has been reduced compared to the 300 microsecond time constant with 6 dB roll-off. And the overload has been resolved. So yes, 24 dB did help the situation. Note that the settling time of the filter is affected by the slope, or how many stages of filter you are using. This has ramifications for your measurement rate if you are performing a sweep or need to do lots of signal averaging. Even if we leave the filter at 6 dB per octave, we can reduce the noise dramatically by enabling synchronous filtering. By default, this is set to off, so I'll go ahead and turn it on. We can ask about X noise again and see that it is reduced to a level that previously required the 100 millisecond time constant, comparing to the value here. The sync filter averages the multiplier's output over one full cycle of the reference frequency. The integral of a sine wave over its period is zero, so all signals at f, 2f, and higher multiples are eliminated by this averaging. Furthermore, the settling time is fast, since the response time of the sync filter is equal to the period of the reference frequency. Here, you'll recall that we are running at one kilohertz, so the settling time of the sync filter is only one millisecond compared to the 100 millisecond time constant that we needed to get the same noise level with simple low pass filtering. Note that the sync filter only works for signal frequencies less than 4.8 kilohertz. This concludes the interactive Python tutorial of the Getting Started Guide. Next time, I'll show you how to wrap the Python commands into a Jupyter notebook so that you don't have to start from scratch in a command terminal anytime you want to communicate with your lock-in. Thanks for joining.